Hi, I'm Luca Dell'Anna, and today I will explain to you what's ergodicity and why it's so important for business, for investing, and for many other areas of our life. Ergodicity is the subject of my best-selling book, and uh, I begin this book with the story of my cousin. He was uh, a very good skier. Since uh, very young, he made it to the world championship for his age bracket. And then, sadly, one leg injury after another, he had to retire very early in his career. And from him, I learned the lesson that it is not the fastest skier who wins the race, but it is the fastest one amongst those who make it to the finish line. And this is a principle which applies to all areas of our life. It is not the best one or the fastest one who wins, but the best one or the fastest one of those who survive. And the implications are many. For example, you shouldn't chase the highest returns, but you should chase the highest returns that do not endanger your business or your investment. Or you shouldn't work as hard as possible, but you should work as hard as possible without endangering uh, your health or your marriage. And here, I'm not making the banal point that survival matters to performance. Instead, I'm making the point that performance is subordinate to survival. And the best ways to demonstrate this is to use a numerical example. Imagine that my cousin participates in a ski championship consisting of 10 races. And because he's a very good skier, he has a 20% chance of winning each race. However, because he also takes a lot of risks, he has a 20% chance of breaking his leg in each race. The question is, how many wins he is expected to collect in a 10 races championship. The naive answer would be that he is expected to win two races. And that would be the number of races, 10, multiplied by the chances of winning each race, 20%. 10 times 20% makes two races. However, that answer is wrong. The correct answer is 0.71. And uh, the reason why he's expected to win so few races is because he can only win the second race if he doesn't break his leg in the first race. And he can only participate in the third race if he doesn't break his leg in the previous two races. And if you crunch the numbers, you see that uh, his chances of participating to all 10 races are very low, and therefore the chances of winning each of them is lower than expected, and uh, in this table, you can see the numbers. The total expected uh, number of wins is only 0 0.71. So here you can see how survival is determinant for performance. And this is true the longer the time horizon that we consider. If we only consider a single race, survival doesn't matter that much, and performance is more important. But if you consider a championship or a career, at this point, survival dwarfs performance. Or better said, performance is subordinate to survival. First of all, you must secure survival. And only afterwards, you can try to optimize performance, but always only optimize performance in a the measure that it doesn't compromise survival. The reason why survival is so important is that irreversibility absorbs future gains. And this applies to all contexts of our lives. In sports, for example, an injury might prevent you from training and therefore it prevents the gain that you could accumulate to training. In relationships, it is true that the more time you spend with a person, usually the better the relationship will go. But if one day you break the trust that that person has in you, they might decide to not want to see you anymore. 
And if you cannot meet them, you cannot rebuild the relationship and you will forego all future gains from the relationship. This principle also applies to investing. If you have $1,000, you invest them in stock and the stock goes down and uh, you only have $200 and then the stock doubles in value again, you will not go from $1,000 to $2,000, but you will only go from $200 to $400. The $800 you lost are not just $800 you lost, but all the future gains that those $800 you lost could have produced in the future. So these are all examples of this principle. Irreversibility absorbs future gains. Before we continue and move towards the definition of agodicity, let me address a common objection I usually get at this stage. And the objection is, Luca, what you're saying matters for long-term performance, but it doesn't matter for short-term performance, for example, a single ski race. And uh, this is partially true, but even a single ski race is an expression of long-term performance because to get to the point where you can participate in a professional ski race, you have had to train for many years before. And that is a, uh, a form of long-term performance. All the years of training where you built uh, know-how and physical power and you avoided injuries, that's long-term performance. And so we might think that a single client meeting or a single sale, they are uh, a moment of short-term performance, but they are always part of a longer context. They are always part of longer-term performance. And so even if you are pursuing a one-month objective, you cannot take risks which could endanger or compromise uh, your work that will have to take place in the future, in the next year or in the next decade. So for example, some principles will be, yes, try to sell something as hard as you can, but always do it without compromising uh, the trust that your clients might have in you. Lot of what it means to achieve longer term performance means to make sure that we can continue or participate in the longer term, means that we can keep accumulating trust and know-how and relationships that produce a compounding interest. For example, everyone talks about how great investor uh, Warren Buffett is, but even his quite impressive uh, compounding rate would not have made him so wealthy if he only had 20 years over which to compound it. So one of the reasons he's so rich is because he prioritized ensuring that he can stay in the business for more than 50 years. So here is a, a very simple rule of thumb you can use. Do not maximize growth but maximize growth without compromising survival. This is not an invitation to excessive prudence, which of course is bad. Rather, it is the realization that there are risks that you can recover from and risks whose consequences are irreversible. And there is a sweet spot between the two where you expose yourself to the former, but not to the latter. And this is a great spot to aim for. And that irreversibility is the key to ergodicity. A simple definition of ergodicity is that an activity is ergodic if its consequences are not irreversible, and otherwise it is non-ergodic. And this distinction might seem overly theoretical, but it has lots of practical applications. For example, you cannot rely on averages if an activity is non-ergodic. We have seen this with skiing. If the average expected wins of participating to a race are 0.2, it doesn't mean that the average expected wins of participating to 10 races is 2.0. It's lower than that. And that's because breaking one's leg has irreversible consequences. 
Another application has to do with investing. For example, if you have a strategy that manages to grab the average yearly return for many years, you will end up with an average return over many years, which is above the average of the market. And this seems very counterintuitive, but it's because there would be a lot of other traders which used a more aggressive strategy and suffered irreversible losses and that brought down their average returns. So here we have another rule of thumb, which is in the presence of irreversibility, you cannot blindly rely on averages. And uh, the reason is because averages only work when you can apply the law of large numbers. But the law of large numbers requires, well, in large numbers of tries. And if you cannot guarantee that you will have a large number of, of tries, you also cannot guarantee that you will eventually grab the average returns. And that's why if you engage in some uh, business venture, for example, you do not just want to know what's the average returns for people who engage in that same kind of venture, but you also want to know what are your chances of achieving the average returns. And a lot of times you can increase your average returns not by trying to move up the average, but by trying to increasing your chances of getting to the average. And that means prioritizing survival over performance. Or at the very least, only caring about performance in the measure that it doesn't compromise survival. The classic example of a non-ergodic activity is the Russian roulette. It is a very dangerous gambler's game where people take a gun with a barrel with six chambers and one bullet, and they randomly spin the barrel so that they do not know where the bullet is. Then they take the gun to their head and they pull the trigger and they have one in six chances of dying. And if they survive, they collect a prize. Of course, very dangerous game. Do not try that at home. But the question is, what are the expected gains of playing Russian roulette? And let's imagine that the price is $6,000. If you play Russian roulette once, the expected gain are $5,000. And that's because you have one in six chances of dying, five in six chances of collecting the prize, and five in six times 6,000 makes $5,000. Second question, what is the average outcome of uh, many people playing Russian roulette once? And uh, the answer is still $5,000. Because imagine that you have 600 players, uh, they each play Russian roulette once, 100 of them dies, 500 of them collect $6,000, 500 times $6,000 makes $3 million, divided by the initial number of players, 600, makes $5,000 each. But now, third and last question, what are your expected gains from playing Russian roulette 600 times? And you might think that the average expected gain is a lot of money because uh, you have uh, $5,000 of expected gains of pulling the trigger once and you pull it many times. But in reality, the average expected gains of playing Russian roulette many times is zero. Because if you keep pulling the trigger, eventually you end up dead and you cannot collect any winnings. So, not only Russian roulette is a non ergodic activity, and therefore you cannot rely on the concept of average gains, but this also gives us a, what I call the ergodic test, which is a simple question that can reveal to you whether an activity is ergodic and therefore whether you can rely on averages. And the ergodic test is, is the outcome of one person performing the activity many times equal to the outcome of many people performing the activity once? If the answer is yes, 
the activities are ergodic and you can uh, rely on averages? And if the answer is no, the activity is non-ergodic and you cannot rely on averages. Instead, you should start thinking really hard about survival. And when I tell you to think about survival, I do not mean to be excessively prudent. Just like cars have brake, not so that they can go slow, but so that they can go fast, the same, you should apply some principle of risk management, not so that you can go slow, but so that you can go fast and safely. And uh, in my book, Ergodicity, I explain a few strategies that you can use to make yourself or your business or your investments more ergodic so that uh, you can grow faster over time. It's a very practical and accessible book. And uh, if you have any questions, you can always write me an email at luca at luca-delana.com. Thank you very much for watching.